Hi, uh, good morning everyone um, and thank you Scott. Um, we're certainly very excited about the relationship with Mount Sinai and uh, and we probably bring the element of, of team science and looking forward to, to doing more team science with, with Sinai. Um, now it's uh, a great pleasure for me to introduce a, a fellow engineer from a top-notch engineering school, uh, Georgia Tech. Um, um, Dr. Gary May is the is the is our next speaker. He's the dean of engineering and a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, in this capacity, he serves as the chief academic officer and manages over 400 faculty and 13,000 students. And in 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 line with what we've been hearing this morning, he's lived through the system, and he started out as an undergraduate himself at Georgia Tech uh, in electrical engineering, and then went on to University of California at Berkeley to obtain his his master's and PhD. He then uh, created a, a vibrant research program in computer aided manufacturing of integrated systems. It's published over 200 technical uh, papers and, and, and contributed to 15 books. Uh, he's contributed to generation of $49 million in, in research funding and has graduated 19 individual PhD students. Um, uh, the other, uh, he's won several distinct honor, um, and one worth mentioning is is, is the uh, mentor award from the American uh, Association for Advancement of Science. And as as you look through his bio, there are two things which he has contributed uh, very dramatically, which have had an impact on a large number of. Uh, of students, uh, he created uh, the summer undergraduate research program in engineering or shore at Georgia Tech, um, which has about 73% rate of students going on from undergraduates to their PhD. So that's a really good program, which has sort of helped a lot of uh, students to pursue graduate careers and, and do research. And, and he's also created another similar program, which is called Facilitating Academics careers in engineering or science or phase, uh, which is geared towards uh, assisting minorities and, and, and mentoring them to pursue academic careers. And um, of, of, of achievement here is that there have been 412 minority students who have re received their PhD under this, this program. So, so it's, a, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dean May, and um, please join me in welcoming him. Thank Deepak for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I should mention just a few things about Georgia Tech. This is what they sort of pay me to do as dean. We, uh, we are the largest program in the country, largest college of engineering in the country, most diverse college of engineering in the country, and one of the very best in terms of size. We're, we have 13,000 students, 450 faculty. We graduate 3,000 degree, engineering degree students per year. Most diverse, we uh, produce the largest number of women engineers, the largest number of African American engineers, and among the largest number of Hispanic engineers in the country. Thank you. And, and in terms of quality, we, we are ranked among the top five in the US and the top 10 in the world by various people who do such things, rankings. So there's quality, quantity, and diversity like at no other place. Uh, so I'm really happy to be in a leadership role. That being said, this is the first time I've ever spoken to a class, uh, to a medical, medical school audience. So um, I wasn't quite sure how to prepare. I, I decided that um, I looked at the, at the uh, agenda and I saw there's a university president speaking, a high-ranking military official. Maybe uh, you know, I'm gonna have to step up my game. But then I also noticed uh, I probably only have to be better than the baseball manager. <laughs> so with that said. I'm going to talk about interdisciplinary team science, a pathway to innovation. This is where I think research, education, and uh, innovation converge and are catalyzed by interdisciplinarity uh, to make uh, successful uh, uh, innovations in, in engineering and science. Uh, let's see. How do I advance this thing? Is this one? Yeah, that doesn't work. All right. Thank you. Now, that just made my engineering degrees all seem rather suspect. OK, so um, let's start off with the definition. What's innovation? Innovation, according to Jeff Nicholson, who uh, was the uh, researcher at 3M Corporation who uh, accidentally invented the post-it note, uh, research is the transformation of money into knowledge, and innovation is the transformation of knowledge into money. Uh, 
The key word in both of those sentences is transformation. Innovation is transformative. It's not just someone uh, in his or her basement or garage inventing the next doohickey. They'll make their life a little bit easier. But it's something that transforms uh, the, way we, the way we live, the way we do business, like a cell phone or something that just completely revolutionizes the way society operates. That's innovation. Um, why is innovation important? It's, it's our real responsibility, I think, as uh, engineers and scientists uh, to make the world a better place through translational discovery, uh, products, instruments, processes that serve people and make their lives better. And uh, that uh, notion is also uh, uh, reflected by the current administration, uh, President Obama, um, uh, despite whether you, how you might feel about other policies, has been a staunch supporter of STEM education, science and engineering research. Uh, and uh, this particular quote uh, sort of reflects that now is the time to reach for a level of research and development not seen since the height of the space race, which he said in the State of the Union address uh, just this year. Um, most people don't automatically associate innovation with university research, um, but that might be a bit of an oversight or a mistake. Uh, here's a list of, a partial list of some of the uh, discoveries that were made through uh, mostly federal funded university research, uh, including the internet itself, uh, Google, uh, computer aided design, barcodes, magnetic resonance Im imaging, weather forecasting, and forensic DNA analysis. Just a short list of some of the uh, discoveries that were enabled by research at universities. So we, we play a very critical role in, in making innovation happen. These are what I think are the hallmarks of a successful innovation ecosystem. You have to have project-based coursework uh, on technology commercialization. We'll come back to that. You have to have mentoring programs for the, for the prospective entrepreneurs and innovators. Accelerating, accelerators, incubators on campus are important. Various forms of competitions to, to get the juices flowing. Entrepreneurship education for both the students and the faculty. And most importantly for this talk, it's very important that the disciplinary barriers are low. Um, so this is a, a graphic that depicts some of the um, innovation ecosystem that our place at Georgia Tech. I'm not going to explain what each of those uh, uh, logos is in detail, but the point here is that we have all of the hallmarks that I mentioned in the previous slide. There are incubators, there are um, uh, there's scholarship in innovation, there are facilities that uh, allow uh, innovation to take place. There are education programs at all levels, graduate, undergraduate, uh, and professional, and various forms of competition, various forms of ways to bring uh, venture capital to, to the campus and to the city and the state to facilitate the startup uh, culture. All these things are really, really important uh, uh, to make a successful ecosystem. So we've had some success. One of the ways you measure innovation is through intellectual property generation. This just shows patent production in the state of Georgia on top. Uh, Georgia Tech is the third largest patent producer in the state behind uh, uh, AT&T and Kimberly-Clark. Now, I have a really good friend who's an executive at Kimberly-Clark who also is an alum of Georgia Tech, and he said most of their patent applications are written by tech alumni, so we could claim number two <laughs> if we want without, without too much drama. Uh, the second uh, the, uh, chart below is... Uh, universities, uh, uh, patents generated at universities, and you can see uh, at least in 2009 we were 13th in the nation, which, you know, 13th is okay. We don't have a medical school, so for universities that don't have any affiliation with a, uh, with a medical school, that's a pretty, pretty good number, about 40 patents a year. Um, in terms of biomedical innovation and translational medicine, lots of mechanisms available to our students and faculty. Um, and I'm going to talk about them in more detail as the talk proceeds. But uh, you can see that the, the ecosystem is magnified uh, for biomedical uh, innovation uh, in, in a way that is not necessarily the case for the other aspects. And I was sure that this would be of most interest to this audience. So um, let's talk a little bit more about some of those. A lot of this uh, is focused within uh, a facility which we call the Petit Institute for Bioengineering and Bioscience. Uh, in addition to being uh, a home for many of our researchers uh, in engineering, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, electrical engineering, uh, chemical engineering, 
as well as biologists, chemists, physicists. Um, this is a place where research teams from those various disciplines work together to work on complex medical research problems, uh, again, taking the interdisciplinary approach. And one of the successful ways that makes that happen, that helps make that happen, is the availability of seed grants that are just small uh, dollar amount grants that allow teams to get together and talk about potential solutions to problems and to demonstrate proof of concept and various uh, uh, discoveries that they'd like to see further funding and further work take place on. Um, and so this Petite Institute is the place where all that happens. And I'll show a picture of the facility in just a second. Another really critical piece is uh, this Coulter Translational Research uh, Program. You can see Wallace Coulter there pictured on the right. Wallace Coulter, if you didn't know, uh, was an alum of Georgia Tech. He was uh, he is famous for the invention of the Coulter blood counter. So all of you had some experience with doing blood counts and so have probably used or, or seen data from a, a CBC. Um, but Wallace had a vision of science serving humanity. Uh, and so uh, as one of the universities that benefits from his foundation's uh, generosity, uh, we have this program where early stage money is, is available uh, for researchers to add value and decrease risk. Um, uh, the key thing here is at the bottom you see that the grant requires uh, a Georgia Tech biomedical engineer uh, as well as an Emory University clinician to work together uh, on a particular problem. So interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity starts to creep in here. Um, we have collaboration across many institutions within the city and the state. Uh, one example is this Atlanta Pediatric Device Consortium, which is an FDA-funded activity. Um, and it's designed, it's, as the name implies, it's uh, to develop devices related to things that can help kids get better. Um, uh, Preclinical and clinical studies and in commercialization of these novel devices for, for pediatrics. It involves Georgia Tech and Emory uh, and our biomedical engineering faculty. It also involves uh, a pediatric cardiologist uh, with the Children's Health Care of Atlanta, uh, which is one of our very key partners in the city, and also has uh, participation from um, the Affleck Cancer Center, uh, which is also part of the Children's Health Care organization, a pediatric hematologist, oncologist. So this team has put together this consortium, which now uh, develops devices for kids um, and, and hopes to commercialize those, those activities. Now, uh, I want to say one thing I think is really important. Um, people think that uh, university innovation stems exclusively from faculty work. That's not necessarily the case. They're actually, what we've uh, seen is, uh, although faculty are, of course, very important and very central to commercializing research ideas, um, there are others involved. And we've seen four pathways to commercialization uh, at universities shown in, in this pie chart. And if you look from clockwise from the top, you have the model where there's a faculty principal investigator and a seasoned entrepreneur. You also have faculty and their PhD student or postdoc. You also have faculty uh, with a postdoc or PhD student and perhaps a business school uh, student or faculty member in pink. And then finally, um, you have the all student efforts. If you count up, if you accumulate all the places where students play a role on this pie chart, 77% uh, of this time, at our place at least, students were instrumental in uh, startup or commercialization efforts. So we think it's very important to continue to, to nurture that and to educate our students about entrepreneurship and, and commercialization. We've been doing several, um, we've developed several programs to help make that happen. One of those is something we call Vertically Integrated Projects, or VIP. The idea here is a team of students from sophomore undergraduates up through PhD students working together uh, over a long term over, on a very big problem. And the problem may have commercialization uh, potential. It also may be a public service sort of project. Um, and the, the, you, you do this with an industry sort of orientation. Um, so uh, the, the, the projects are beneficial to the faculty members of research who's overseeing the, the team, but also the students are getting credit or, or whatever they need to get from, from the experience as well. Uh, my favorite example of a VIP project, it doesn't have a medical or, or biological um, uh, application, but uh, at our football games, um, we have something called East Stadium. And if you go to a football game at Georgia Tech and you pull out your smartphone and go to eStadium.tech.edu, you can get a personalized game experience. You can get your own instant replays, your own stats, uh, and, and everybody in the stadium can see what they want to see, when they want to see it at our football games. Of course, it's hard to make a call on your cell phone because of the bandwidth issues during, that, during the games. But uh, other than that, it's a pretty exciting project. Other universities have, have since 
inquired about how to make that happen at their football and, and now basketball arenas. So, uh, but that's an example of some of the one of the projects. Another good example is uh, there's a team working on uh, secure electronic voting in developing nations in partnership with the Carter Center. They did a, the last election in the Philippines was was done uh, through the the uh, project uh, team that. Uh, um, through this VIP program and the project team that worked on that project. Um, so lots of interesting stuff. Um, there's also uh, extracurricular or co-curricular stuff that happens in addition to VIP. There's something called the Adventure Prize, which is really cool. Um, this is a program that's an invention competition for undergrads. Uh, we started out with about 600 teams, maybe 700 teams of students uh, looking to present their invention and win a prize of $20,000, first prize, um, and, and uh, to commercialize their work and perhaps start a company. Um, we call this, or at least the students have nicknamed this competition, uh, American Idol for Geeks. Um, <laughs> And it works just like American Idol. When we get to the sixth finalist uh, at the final presentation, it's televised on Georgia Public Television. And there's a team of judges, a panel of judges that it's sort of like Shark Tank. They're entrepreneurs. They're venture capitalists. They're people that have some expertise in, in doing this. And they ask the student inventors questions. And they you know, inquire about the presentations they're going to make. There's also an audience vote. There's a studio audience. And there's also a, a TV audience vote, so just like American Idol. And as I said, the winner gets $20,000, and we pay for the patent of their invention. And the second place is $15,000. I think we pay for that patent, too. And we help to give them some advice and some counsel to get their uh, business started if that's what they choose to do. Um, one of the neat uh, devices that came out of this competition was a magnetic intubation device that takes, instead of sticking an intubation tube down someone's throat, it, uh, it's a very slender, flexible tube that's guided by a magnet and does essentially the same thing. And I think that one, one that was only second prize that year. But uh, I think for this audience, I thought that was an interesting one. Um, there have been many other examples of really, really cool uh, Inventure Prize um, products. Uh, at the graduate level, we've just started a professional master's degree in biomedical innovation and development, or BioID. Uh, the idea here is to take uh, uh, discoveries from bench to bedside uh, and through the valley of death, if you will, transforming research to a practical, usable processes, devices, or techniques to improve patient care. Um, we have 10 students in the first cohort that just started this fall. We hope to grow that to maybe 2025 at Estadia State. Um, but we're you know, using uh, people that have practical experience uh, developing uh, techniques in the, in the biomedical industry to, to teach, the co teach the courses associated with the BioID um, professional masters. And we think there's a pretty good market for this to continue to grow. Um, so why, where does interdisciplinary uh, work, why uh, is interdisciplinary research important for all of this? Um, the value of interdisciplinary teams is they push fields toward, uh, forward in accelerating discovery. Um, it's sort of almost cliche now. We say that the really tough problems, really interesting problems, are at the boundaries of the disciplines, not within a given discipline. They involve several disciplines. And inter interdisciplinary training takes uh, people in the workforce that uh, takes, uh, undertakes these challenges in, in, in innovative ways. Uh, and for biomedical research in particular, the idea is to bring the basic science, the clinical and health service researchers all together in the pursuit of development testing and implementation of, of this, these new ideas and treatments. Um, uh, there are some obstacles in doing this, however, and, and you may be familiar with some of this. Uh, academics, we academics are not traditionally trained to work together. We're trained to go off and make a contribution individually, present that contribution, and get our, uh, defend our thesis and get it signed and, and move on about our business. Um, the reward structure is often, not bi is often biased toward the efforts of individuals for that reason. Um, the administrative structure, we have silos. We have a Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. We have a Department of Biomedical Engineering. We have a Department of Computer Science um, that are they're not um, necessarily oriented toward uh, supporting collaborative work. Um, so there's fragmented communication between the researchers. And sometimes there can be lack of resources to support uh, teamwork. Um, so in order to remove these barriers, uh, some of the things you have to do, you have to, first of all, what we found has been successful is to co-locate uh, researchers from various departments, get rid of the silos, and I'll show some examples of that. Have those folks use shared core facilities. Not only does that get people working together, but it also is, is cheaper in the long run because you don't have to duplicate how many electron microscopes do you need on your campus, right? So uh, the idea is to get people to, to work together using the same instruments and the same processes and the same equipment in core facilities that are shared. Uh, and, and then put these people together into what we've, we're calling these institutes. Um, 
have to have institutional commitment, the leadership, the administration must be supportive uh, and, and behind this. And I talked about having seed grants and frequent interaction and communication between the researchers is key. Um, credit is probably one of the most important things. You have to make sure that everyone who's participating in the team gets the proper amount of credit due to their contributions. Um, people are more likely to continue to collaborate if they feel like they're being recognized appropriately. Uh, so, and, uh, and then from a, that's from an individual standpoint. From a unit standpoint or college or school standpoint, a college will be more willing to contribute to um, these activities if the, the, the overhead that's recovered uh, goes in a proportional way to, to the particular participating colleges. And that's something we're still working on. But we're, we do recognize that that's an issue and, and it's something that's going to be necessary to make this continue to flourish. So I talked about facilities. These are a few examples. Uh, the upper left is the Petit Institute that we discussed before. But every new building that we build on our campus, we don't build an electrical engineering building. We don't build an aerospace engineering building. We don't build a civil engineering building. We build uh, an institute or a facility that's, that's focused on a given uh, uh, grand challenge problem, like bioengineering or bioscience, like nanotechnology, like molecular science, like environmental science and technology. And we co-locate engineers, scientists, uh, sometimes policy, uh, faculty, uh, all in the same building. So you're in the office next door to you. I'm an engineer. My, the next person in the next office might be a biologist. We believe that helps to, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, these coffee table or uh, water cooler type conversations uh, make ideas flourish and get uh, research off the ground and, and make it uh, helps the interdisciplinary environment to, to the culture to flourish. Um, there's some results. Uh, as an example, uh, we have here pictured uh, Kirk, Ajit, and James, an engineer from biomedical engineering, uh, uh, an MD who, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon uh, from Children's, and um, James is an associate professor of pediatrics at Emory, have worked together on a technique to improve blood flow in children born with, uh, with one functional ventricle. Uh, and the research has shown some promise and, and likely to be commercialized uh, in, in the future. Uh, this would not happen if we didn't have this culture of interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, Cardio Mems is another example. This is a company that already exists. The way this company got started is um, uh, uh, an MD saw, I don't know if he re was reading the technical journal or just heard of this research that was being done by an electrical engineer on our campus, a colleague of mine, who was developing, developing uh, a wireless pressure sensor for harsh environments. And the harsh environment was an aircraft engine. And the, the MD said, well, maybe this could be used in the human body. So they got together and they, just, they developed this endo sensor, it's called, to, to do uh, uh, sensing of annual it's, uh, um, I think the device is inserted by catheter into, I believe, the femoral artery, and uh, you know, and you, and you can be wanted by your uh, by your physician, or it can be done remotely. And the patient, uh, the data from uh, the pre pressure data from the patient is given to the physician so that he or she can check to see uh, if if an aneurysm is developing or if other things or bad things are happening. Anyway, the company uh, has been through clinical trials and um, is. Uh, uh, has some interest from St. Jude Medical in terms of a, a, a liquidity event, and it's uh, an, a, very, a very good example of a success story. Again, interdisciplinary collaboration leading to commercial success. Uh, another example, uh, Axion Biosystems. Uh, this uh, device, I think it's, uh, it's the micro electro electrode array to uh, in interrogate uh, cell cultures uh, ex vivo in a, in a petri dish to look for um, uh, toxicity and, and do drug screening. Uh, the key thing here is this uh, device was developed by a team of electrical engineers and biomedical engineers, again at one of our one of our institutes on campus that facilitates interdisciplinary collaboration. And Axion is just uh, is doing well. Now, uh, let's go from individual investigators and group investi groups of investigators to entire departments. I think this is one of our uh, best success stories. And this is the GT or Georgia Tech Emory Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, and started uh, almost 20 years ago, um, almost uh, 30 years ago now, uh, with a seed grant between Georgia Tech and Emory in 1987. Uh, which later uh, developed into a Whitaker Foundation uh, program and grant. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, the provost at Georgia Tech and the dean of the medical school at Emory decided to create a joint department uh, in 1997. 
So in just the uh, 16 years since then, uh, various grants from the Coulter Foundation to build a facility to, to get the programs off the ground, uh, some very big NIH awards, uh, and um, in 2008 we celebrated the 10 year anniversary of the program, uh, and the program was already in the top five, the second largest BME program in the, in the US. Uh, currently, uh, 40 faculty, um, about three fourths at Georgia Tech, the rest at Emory, um, $33 million in research expenditures and 200 graduate students uh, in this joint department between a public and a private institution, which I think uh, still remains the only public-private partnership of its kind in the U.S. As I said, the number two program in the country, uh, the largest program in the country. Um, the, the way you know this really works is because you can, the, the faculty at Emory or Georgia Tech have a, have a parking pass that works at both universities. That's how you know <laughs> the institutions are really collaborating effectively. Um, so uh, uh, quite a success story, I, I would say. Now, in closing, I think uh, university environments are clearly breeding grounds for creativity, exchange of ideas, interdisciplinarity, uh, but the way to make those, these things effective, to make it happen, is to have the right sort of infrastructure, the right sort of educational programs in place, facilities to accommodate, and, uh, to accommodate the, the, the culture and the uh, innovation uh, and interdisciplinary ecosystem. And I think that's uh, my final slide except for the um, pretty picture of the Georgia Tech Tower, and I'd be happy to take one or two questions if there's time. Thank you. Time for questions from the audience. Um, thank you, that was a great presentation. Uh, what would you say that you should be looking for in the individuals, like what qualities in the individuals that you're, when you're trying to create an interdisciplinary team? Like what qualities do the individuals have to have to work together well? I think the most important thing is just a willingness to work as a part of a team and some sense of, the, per the individual has to get some sense of accomplishment by being a part of a team and not feeling like he or she has to drive all of the success individually. Now there's some people that uh, are going to be individual contributors and that's fine. We're not trying to, to scare all those people off or get rid of them, but I think the, 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 the fruitful, um, the most productive areas of potential success going forward are going to require interdisciplinary teams to, to tackle these problems. Hi, I'm Toby. Um, it's Hi, Toby. good to hear more about your presentation um, and just engineering and bio uh, medical work at um, Georgia Tech. Um, I'm over at Wild Cornell. I'm a statistical programmer. So my interest, um, based off of what you said, is just how are you working with the Department of Computing or the College of Computing? How do you guys interact? We interact in a number of ways with computing. At Georgia Tech, there's a college of computing, which is a different model for most, uh, most places. And the, the computing folks and our engineering folks, we have several joint programs uh, uh, educationally at the undergraduate and graduate level, as well as uh, several joint research centers. So it's a pretty seamless operation uh, uh, that uh, uh, works extremely well. We have joint appointments between the two colleges. Uh, you name it, any types of collaboration that you can think of probably is already is, is existing between engineering and computing. So Dean May, thanks again for a terrific talk here. Thank you. I have a question that uh, I understand would be completely trivial, but I'm going to ask it because I get asked that question a lot by okay. my colleagues at Northwestern, and that is, how the heck did Georgia Tech manage to get Google to film the movie <laughs> Internship on the campus of Georgia Tech? I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, <laughs> but the movie Internship, it's the, the uh, what's the, uh, uh, Owen Wilson and, and Vince Vaughn movie about when they are old guys who get laid off and they go back to Google for an internship. It's filmed on our campus. It's actually, it's like wedding crashers at Google is what it really is. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, our, our public affairs people do a good job of reaching out. It's, it, movie industry is, is increasingly moving to Georgia because of tax benefits and, and other, other benefits. Uh, it was, a, it was a, actually a pleasure to, to host. The, those guys were very nice and, and it was really cool to see our campus on, in, on the big screen. I was trying to walk by the camera in some of the scenes to <laughs> see if I can get a, a, one of those uh, cards, Studio Actors Guild cards. I, I didn't get one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.